thank you so much for this opportunity to talk. And I am going to start with a story. Uh, and, and I want to say at the outset that I'll plan to talk for about 45 minutes. I want to leave plenty of time for questions. Um, and I will leave lots of time in the chat room um, to answer questions and also give my personal email. And I, I want to start by sharing my screen and by giving you a story that really was the foundation for this talk that I will be sharing with you tonight on the psychology of courage and in action. So my oldest child, Andrew, started college just about four years ago now. And we didn't hear much from him for the first couple of weeks, an occasional email saying, you know, hey, how do I do laundry? Or could I get some more money? Or, you know, something like that. And about two weeks in, one night my phone rang and it was Andrew and his voice was breaking. And he said, mom, someone died in my dorm last night. And then he told me the story. And the story is one that even if you don't know the particulars, is all too familiar to all of us. Uh, the student had been drinking at around 9 p.m. He fell and hit his head and his friends, his roommate watched over him for hours because they wanted him to be okay. So they checked to make sure he was still breathing. They strapped a backpack around his shoulders to prevent him from rolling onto his back and then vomiting and choking to death. But what they didn't do for nearly 19 hours was call 911. And when they finally did call, it was too late. The student's family flew in from out of town. They were with him when the hospital disconnected the kid from life support, but he died. 19 years old, first two weeks of college. And when Andrew told me that story, I was just struck as a professor who of course works with many students and as a mom of three about how that story could have gone differently if one of those kids had have picked up the phone and gotten help faster. And that story actually prompted the work that I'll be talking about to you today, which is also the, the topic of my most recent book. But that story of inaction plays out in all sorts of settings, not just in college dorm rooms or fraternities. It plays out all the time. In March of this year, one of my friends called. Um, she lives with me in, in Western Mass. She has a daughter, Claire, who graduated from college last May and is living in Boston. Claire was adopted as a baby from China and is living in Boston in mid-March of this year, last year, 2020. And she's heading to work one day on the bus. And it's right around the time that the you know, coronavirus pandemic is sort of you know, sweeping the country and places are starting to shut down. And a man on the bus stands up, points at her and says, you should go back to China. You and your people have brought us the coronavirus. You're killing Americans, you should go back. So the man is on the bus, the bus is crowded, the man is yelling and Claire is like 21 years old. No one on the bus thinks that Claire brought the coronavirus <laughs> to America. And yet no one on the bus said anything. No one on the bus told the man to shut up. No one on the bus went over and sat with Claire and tried to reassure her. No one did anything. Like another example of inaction. And when I saw the video coming out of Minneapolis last spring of an officer kneeling on George Floyd's neck, all I could think about was not actually that officer. It was the three other officers who were with him. And if one of those three other officers who are with him had have pulled him off and said, what are you doing? Stop it. George Floyd would be alive today. And so I'm starting with those three examples because inaction is all around us. It's around us in locker rooms. It's around us on public transportation. It's around us in all sorts of workplaces. It's around us in PTA meetings. It's around us around the Thanksgiving dinner table. And so what I'm interested in is this idea of an action. Are there times in which we've been somewhere and we've seen or heard something kind of problematic and we have failed to step up and do something? And so I wanna start 
with our first poll question. And our first poll question is in fact about this topic. And so I wanna start by asking you all, this is participatory. Have you ever seen or heard something that you felt was problematic, but failed to speak up? And your choices are, yes, that's happened to me, or it's, no, I've never failed to speak up, or it's, no, I've actually never seen something problematic. And I'll just give you like, you know, 30 seconds or so, and then I'll share your results, but it's totally anonymous. Um, and about half of you have voted so far. So I'm going to give you about another 15 seconds. So go ahead and vote if you want to get your vote in. 75% of you have voted now. Um, I'm going to give you 10 more seconds. If the last, there's 10 people who have not yet voted, nine people. Anyone else wants to get a vote in? Last chance. <laughs> and, and there will be other poll opportunities, don't worry. Um, and that was 80% of you. So I'm gonna end it now and I'm gonna share the answers. And here are your results. 94% of us have been in that situation. So I've been doing this talk now for just about a year. I do this polling whenever they have that technology. I've never seen a number lower than 90 in any group. I've done it in law firms. I've done it in um, with groups of teachers. <laughs> I've done it, you know, all over. I never see less than 90. Um, and that's because it's a universal experience. It's a universal experience that we've all been in settings in which we've seen or heard something problematic and we have failed to speak up. Um, it's a very universal experience. And as I've been talking about this topic, as I've been doing book promotion over the last few months, every time I talk to a reporter or a podcast interviewer or whatever, um, somebody says something um, to me and they'll say, you know, I just have to tell you about this one time. And then they'll tell me some story. And sometimes it'll be a story of, you know, it was 30 years ago or it was whatever, but everyone has a story, almost everyone that they can think about at the time in which they wish somebody had stepped up to help them. They feel bad about not stepping up or so on. And so I now want to turn to a really fundamental question. Why? Why do we get in situations in which we see or hear something problematic and we fail to speak up? So one issue is something that I call the perils of ambiguity that in many situations we see or hear something, but we're not exactly sure what we're hearing or seeing. Is that student just drunk or is that student really in medical trouble? Is that just harmless flirting or is that kind of sexual harassment? Um, is that uh, just a joke or is that sort of offensive what that person just said? And so there are times in which things are ambiguous and we don't know what to do because we don't really know what we're hearing or seeing. There was a classic example of this that occurred a number of years ago in England. There's a little boy, Jamie, who's the small figure pictured there on your screen. Jamie was in a crowded shopping mall um, with his mom and he became separated. They looked everywhere for him, they couldn't find him. And about two days later, Jamie's body showed up He'd been beaten to death and left behind beside a local, a nearby railroad track. So the police went back and combed through video footage. This image that I'm showing you right now is pulled from a video camera at the mall. And what you can see here is that Jamie was being taken away by an older boy. In the video, Jamie is kicking and screaming. He's saying, let me go, you know, leave me alone. I don't wanna go, et cetera. And lots of people saw, as you can see in the image, the mall was crowded. But here's the issue. We've all seen a two-year-old having a fit in a mall. It's not a situation that cries out emergency. Many, many people saw, and they assumed it's a little boy who's going away with his brother, and he wants a candy bar, he wants a toy, or he doesn't want to leave. Lots of people saw it, and no one assumed it was an emergency, so no one got help. And that situation happens in all different kinds of settings. In one really clever study, psychologists brought in people to take a study in a small room. As they were filling out the survey in this small room alone, smoke started pouring into the room. And the question was, what would people do? So if you're in a room alone and smoke starts pouring in, pretty much everybody immediately stands up and goes to get help because they're like, it's smoke. 
it's an emergency. I have to go get help. It's pretty obvious. But then in another version of the study, they did something different. They hired two people, friends of the experimenters, and they told these two people, no matter what happens, just keep filling out your questionnaire. Do not look up, just keep filling it out. So you're in a room, there's three of you, you and these other two people who you think are just other students. Smoke starts pouring in. And the question is, what do you do? Well, so you look up, you look at these other two people, and they're just filling out their surveys. And they let the smoke continue to pour into the room for six minutes. It got so thick that people actually couldn't see the survey. They had to like wave it away and then fill it out and then like wave it away to even be able to fill out the survey. And what they found was that most people sit in that room as it's filling with smoke because they look at the other two people and they're just filling out their surveys, waving away the smoke and they don't react. As a room is filling up with smoke, people just sit. So they end the study and the researchers then say, hey, um, did you notice the smoke? And everyone's like, yes, yes, I did. And then they say, well, what'd you think it was? And they have all sorts of non-emergency explanations. I thought it was an air conditioning vent malfunctioning. I thought it was um, truth serum you were pumping in the room. They have all of these different explanations and none of them are smoke, fire, because they looked to the other two people. And when those people didn't react, they assumed that it must not be an emergency. And that's the challenge. In ambiguous situations, what do we do? We look to people around us. But here's the challenge. If everyone is looking at everyone else and no one wants to appear that they're overreacting or stupid or overly sensitive, then no one actually gets help because inaction begets inaction. And this is a finding that is not surprising to social psychologists. Um, many people can remember a time in which they've been in a classroom, maybe in high school, maybe in college, in which the professor said, do you have any questions? And you in fact had a question, but when you went to raise your hand, you looked around and you saw that no one else had their hand up, so you put your hand down. And you know why you put your hand down. You put your hand down because you didn't wanna look stupid. And when you looked at everyone else and they're not raising their hands, you think, well, I must be the only one with a question, so I'm not gonna raise my hand. Um, but here's what's amazing. You know exactly why you didn't raise your hand. You didn't wanna look stupid. But when you ask people, well, why didn't other people raise their hands? You don't think, well, they don't wanna look stupid. No, you think they're really smart. They don't have any questions. It's just me. And that's this challenge of ambiguity is that we assume our behavior is driven by something entirely different from other people's behavior, but that can lead us to fail to get help in all different kinds of emergencies. So one factor that inhibits people from taking action is we don't really know what's going on. We look to other people and if they're not acting like anything's going on, we assume it must be no big deal. But again, that can lead everyone to feel internally like there's a problem and yet not speak up. But in other conditions, we see something and we totally know it's a problem. It's not ambiguous, but here's the problem. If we're in a group setting and we see something problematic, we often sit back and say, well, those other people can help. I don't have to, I'm not responsible. Many of us probably remember seeing these images. Um, this was taken from a United Airlines plane about three years ago when which uh, the flight was overbooked and no one would stand up. And so uh, a man was dragged unwillingly off the plane. Um, bumped his head on a seat rest, I think had a concussion, I think he broke a tooth, I mean, it was a disaster. And here's the thing, everyone on that plane knew it was a problem. And that's why we know what happened, because they started, the airport security started dragging this man off the plane, and everybody on the plane took up their cell phone and started videoing it, because they were like, this is awful. And yet, no one on that plane stood up and said, stop dragging that man off the plane, this is terrible. They just sat and videoed it. But here's the challenge. They were just passengers on a plane. Each individual person was like, well, I'm not the pilot. I'm not a flight attendant. I'm not the police. I don't know what to do. I'm not responsible. And so in group settings, people often reduce effort 
And this happens in all different kinds of cases. Many of you probably remember hearing about the classic case of Kitty Genovese, um, who was murdered in New York City a number of years ago. And as that case was reported at the time, and let me just be clear, there's some recent evidence suggesting that the case was not exactly reported correctly by the press. But as the case was reported at the time, um, Kitty Genovese was returning home to her apartment at about 3 a.m. when a man jumped out of the bushes and started stabbing her. And she screamed, um, the man ran, and people in the, light, in the apartments all around turned on their lights to try to figure out what was going on. But as it was reported at the time, no one came down to help her. The man then jumped out of the bushes and proceeded to stab her to death. When the police later interviewed people in the apartment complex and said, did you see or hear anything? Overwhelmingly, they said, yes, yes, we did. And then they said, well, did you call the police? And overwhelmingly, what people were reported as saying is, well, I thought about it, but then I looked and I saw all these other lights on. So I figured somebody else must have done it. And so that's an example of something that psychologists often call diffusion of responsibility, that in group settings, we don't feel personally responsible for helping because in fact, we think, well, lots of other people could do so. I don't have to be the one. Um, in a very clever study designed to test this feeling of diffusion of responsibility, researchers brought in college students and told them they would be having a discussion about adjusting to college life and that to keep everything private, they would be in an a private room for the discussion and they would communicate only with the other students through intercoms on the wall. Now, the students started in their own little rooms, introducing themselves to the people around them. And during those introductions, one person, John said, hey, um, I need to tell everybody, I actually have a seizure disorder. And sometimes when I'm in little small rooms like I am right now, um, it can bring on a seizure and that can actually be really serious, even life-threatening. So if you hear me slurring my words or not responding, it's really important that you go and get help. All right, so you come in, you're in this study, you're in this group with these other six people, but you can't see anybody else. And there's this person, John, who you now know has a seizure disorder. Now, here's what the researchers did to vary it. In one condition, you believe that everybody can hear John and all the other students, that the intercoms work effectively for everybody. But in another version of the study, they said, John's intercom is malfunctioning. So you are the only person who can hear what John says. So anytime John speaks, you have to share what he said with the rest of the group. So as you can probably imagine where I'm going, John starts having a seizure, starts slurring his words. And the question is, who stands up and goes and gets help? So in what is kind of good news, kind of bad news, if you believe that you are the only one who can hear John, that you're the only one who's John's intercom works to reach, 85% of people immediately stand up and go and get help when John appears to have a seizure. So that's good news in that it's most people, 85%. It's bad news in that I always think, who are the 15% of people who are like, I'm just gonna sit here while John has a seizure and do nothing. But nonetheless, 85% um, of people do go and get help. But, what happens when everybody believes that everybody can hear John having a seizure? Very few people go and get help. Way fewer than half of people ever leave their experimental room because each of them is like, well, I know John's having a seizure, but you know what? These other people could go, I don't have to. And that's again, an example that plays out all the time in daily life. Um, this is something that psychologists often call social loafing, which is our tendency to reduce effort on social tasks when we're in a group. This is why restaurants impose a mandatory tipping fee on parties of five or six or more, because people are much less generous um, when they're with a the group because they say, well, you know what? Somebody else can kind of pick up my share. I'm, I'm not gonna contribute so much. So another factor that leads us overwhelmingly to fail to step up and help is we don't feel responsible in different situations. But the last and often the most uh, pressing reason in which people often fail to step up is that we worry about the costs of doing so. And there are in fact often real costs to stepping up and acting. In some cases, it can involve our personal safety. You probably heard the story about these three men who were on a train in Portland, Oregon a number of years ago when a man who was clearly crazy stood up and started yelling racist slurs 
at a young African-American woman and a young Muslim woman wearing a hijab on a train. These three men did the right thing. They stood up, they told that man to stop it. And he pulled out a knife and he stabbed them. And two of these three men lost their lives. And that kind of fear of the personal safety consequences do inhibit people sometimes from stepping up. But fortunately, that's not a particularly common situation. What's far more common is we worry about the professional consequences. Uh, when I was a college student a number of years ago, I had an internship one summer with a doctor. And one day we were driving in his car. He was driving, I was a passenger to a meeting where he was gonna make a presentation. So we pulled into the parking lot of the building where he was gonna make his presentation. We circled the lot. He was kind of running late and um, the lot was totally full. There were no spots. So he circled it and then he pulled immediately into the handicap spot. Now this man was not handicapped. He did not have a handicap the plaque. He was totally able-bodied. So he pulls into this handicap slot and I knew it was horrible. I was like, this is terrible. What if somebody who needs a slot comes and you're in this slot? This is awful. So we get out of the car. I didn't say anything. We walk out and I look up at the sign and then I kind of look at him, you know, to kind of make that eye contact. And he looks at me, smirks, and then he starts limping, you know, heading to the building. And I didn't say anything. I didn't say that's ridiculous. You know, you shouldn't do this or this is wrong or I'll stay with the car or anything. I just shut up and I walked with him into the building. Um, and, and that's because I wanted a letter of recommendation. I was hoping that he would like me. I was hoping that he might hire me and I didn't want to make trouble. And that situation happens in all sorts of far more serious situations. There's an interview by the New York Times two years ago with longtime Harvey Weinstein collaborator, actor, director, Quentin Tarantino. And the reviewer asked him, did you know what was going on with Harvey Weinstein all those years? And here's what Quentin Tarantino said. I knew enough to do more than I did. Now, what Quentin Tarantino did was nothing. What he did was nothing. But he was not the only one. Many people knew something about what Harvey Weinstein was doing, but they failed to speak up because he was making or breaking careers and they worried about being a troublemaker. So they stayed silent. And that situation plays out in all different kinds of circumstances. Given where this talk is, I'm pretty certain most people here are familiar with the fabulous Boston Globe Spotlight team as profiled in the Oscar award-winning movie. Um, that broke the scandal that was happening within the Catholic Church in which priests were molesting little boys and girls and they were being passed from parish to parish. Lots of people knew what was going on and lots of people failed to speak up. And finally, we worry about the personal costs. We worry about not being liked. We worry about not being accepted by our friends, by our fraternity brothers, by our neighbors, sometimes by family members. I started today by talking about a student who died in my son's dorm room, but that situation plays out in all kinds of situations. This young man, Tim Piazza, was 19 years old, a sophomore at Penn State University. When he fell down a flight of stairs, highly drunk during a fraternity initiation process. His fraternity brothers dragged him upstairs, put him on a couch, and they watched his abdomen turned purple as it filled with blood. And yet, they chose not to call 911. Each of them individually kind of worried. I don't know, maybe he's not okay, but they worried. If I call the police, if I get help for this kid, maybe I'm gonna be ostracized by my group. Maybe they're not gonna like me. And that contributed to Tim Piazza's death. We know now from research in social neuroscience that this fear about rejection and how it feels actually hurts us deep, deep inside a neurological level. Researchers have designed very clever studies in which they create a feeling of being ostracized. So you come into the lab, you're in an fMRI machine measuring brain activity, and they create a feeling of being ostracized in which other group members in a ball throwing task that you're participating in are throwing the ball to each other and they're ignoring you. The question is, how does that feel? 
And what the research shows that being rejected, being ostracized by other people activates a particular part of the brain that the, is the exact same part of the brain that is activated when you experience physical pain, when you spill hot coffee on your arm, when you stub your toe, when you have a paper cut. So that tells us that feeling rejected by our group actually feels the same as physical pain. And it's a reason why we go out of our way to avoid that feeling. We don't want to experience pain, but that can lead us to stay silent, especially in the face of bad behavior committed by group members, our fraternity brothers, family members, colleagues, and so on. And so I now want to turn to our second poll question, which is I've now discussed the different factors that lead people to fail to speak up. And I want to ask you, if you've ever in any circumstance failed to speak up, what led you to do so? Ambiguity about what was happening? Feeling like it wasn't your responsibility or fear of the consequence? And I'll just give you a minute um, to look at that. All right, I've, um, boy, already 50% of you have voted. I'm gonna give you like another, I'm gonna give you like another 10 seconds. So if you wanna get a vote in. Vote for two things? I don't think it was set up that you could vote for two things. Sorry, you have to choose one. There is a way to do that, but I don't think we did, which was my fault. Um, so choose which happened most recently or um, and I now have 73% of you voted 76. Um, I'm going to give you five more seconds and then I'm going to stop the poll and I'm going to show you your results. If you want to get a result in, this is your last chance. And let's see your answers. Again, um, this is very common. So half of you said it was fear of consequences. And again, that's the most common thing. But as you can also see here, ambiguity also plays a role and sometimes feeling like it was not your responsibility. So now I'm gonna to turn to what I call the more optimistic, uplifting part of the talk, don't worry. Um, and, that, and this is really why I love giving this talk because I wanna end by talking about strategies. And the reason why I love studying this is that lots of research shows that understanding what inhibits us from taking action can actually help us overcome that tendency. And in some cases, make a real difference. You might recognize this picture. It's of a young girl, Elizabeth Smart. You probably remember this story. She was kidnapped, age 14, from her Utah home. There was no sign of her for about nine months. And one day, a husband and wife were walking in a small town in Utah when they saw three figures, a man and two women. Now the women were covered. They, they were wearing robes that hid most of their face and all of their hair. You could only see their eyes. And yet the man turned to his wife and said, doesn't that kind of look like Elizabeth Smart? And she said, I don't know, maybe. And he goes, you know what? I'm just gonna call the police. So he called, he reported it. They continued to do their shopping. They didn't really think anything of it. And later that night, they got a call. They had in fact found Elizabeth Smart and she was rescued. And if that couple doesn't make that call that night, she's probably not alive today. So that call probably saved her life. And that's an example about how one person stepping up and doing the right thing can make a world of difference. And in what seems like a particularly apt quote to share with you today, and is one of my favorites, from Martin Luther King Jr. History will have to record that the greatest tragedy of this period of social transition was not the strident clamor of the bad people, but the appalling silence of the good people. And my theory, my belief, is that there are very few psychopaths in the world. And that's a good thing for all of us. And I imagine I'm not talking to any psychopaths on this call, but here's the challenge. I believe that there are lots and lots of us who are appallingly silent good people. And I'm hoping that by giving this talk and talking about what the research tells us about why we stay silent, 
we can all find the courage to step up in all different kinds of situations. And I now wanna to turn to some strategies that empirical research tell us in fact work. One, you need training and you need practice. That will actually help you step up in different circumstances. Um, these three men were on a train in France when a man stood up with an assault rifle and started firing. And these three young Americans charged him, grabbed the gun away and saved everybody on that train. They asked these men later, what led you to be so brave to charge this gunman? And here's what they said. Well, I'm just a guy who didn't wanna die on a train in France, but that's not really true. Um, two of these three men had actually been trained. They'd been in the army reserves. They were American citizens who'd actually been trained in the military. So that led them to have the courage to step up and to know what to do in the moment. And that training and the opportunity to practice it made a world of difference. Uh, many of us are CPR certified. And when you get CPR certified, what you know is that you have to keep getting it newly certified every year or two. It's not like your driver's license where you take it and then it's good forever. You have to keep getting renewed for your CPR certification because people want you to be able to put those skills into action if you're ever in a situation in which that's called for. So that's an example of how training and practice with that training really makes a difference. And listen, it doesn't have to be joining the military or going through an extensive training course. It can be just playing through examples in your mind in daily life. This point was brought home to me during my senior year of college. I was a student at Stanford University and I was in um, uh, the fourth floor of a building in a psychology class when the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake heard, um, hit. So those of you who are a little bit older might remember this earthquake. It was like a 6.9. It was a very big earthquake. It happened during the middle of the World Series. The game was canceled. It collapsed a bridge. A number of um, fires broke out in San Francisco and some people died. So it was a very big earthquake. So I'm in this class. The earthquake hits. The building is swaying back and forth. And all of the students in this class look up at the professor because we're like, what do we do? We have no idea. And of course, the professor is the person in charge. So we look up at the professor and I remember it still to this day. She grabbed the edge of her desk and she looked out at all of us and she goes, I'm from New York. And of course, what she's saying is, I have no idea what to do. This is not part of the professor job. Um, and a student in the class stood up and goes, I'm from California get under the table. And we all did and we were all fine. But so that's an example of he had the training. Why? Because he grew up in California. Um, and so training and practice make a world of difference. And we can all do things to practice and train how we can speak up in different settings. Um, here's an example. How do we respond to so-called microaggressions? So microaggressions describe, you know, um, casual sort of offensive things that people say. And these are some examples of here of, you know, well, you don't act like you are a black person or you don't speak Spanish or no, really, where are you from? So those are all kinds of things that the people aren't meaning to be offensive, but are kind of problematic. And so the question is, how can you respond if you're in a setting and somebody says something offensive? Um, one of my favorites was when people would say, wow, can't vote for a woman, a woman, women are too emotional to be president. Um, and so the question is, how do you respond to that? And there are lots of things that we can do. There are lots of casual ways that we can respond by assuming they're joking. Ha ha ha. Surely I know that you're being sarcastic, but some people might believe that. Um, or you could say, you know, I used to think that too. And then I found, again, you might say, yeah, you know, I, I know you're probably just joking, but that actually, you know, is sensitive to me because my sister or, you know, whatever. So again, there are lots of ways in which we can speak up in all kinds of situations in a way of calling out bad behavior um, and, and taking a stand. Um, ask for clarification. What did you mean by that? Separate intent from impact. I know you didn't probably realize this, but share your process. I used to say that too. And, and the key here is that Responding to things that are problematic, that are offensive in some way, doesn't have to be standing up and saying, you're a racist, or you're a jerk, or you're stupid. They can be ways of saying, I find this problematic. And that's important. Um, a couple of years ago, a very good student of mine, really smart kid, 
was in my office. He was on the basketball team. And he said, every day when I'm in the locker room, someone says something offensive. Sometimes I speak up and sometimes I don't. And that story always struck me because it's very likely that every day in the locker room when someone says something offensive, lots of other people in that locker room are also thinking that's offensive, but no one speaks up. And so they think it's just them. So one of the keys is figuring out ways in which you can identify that you find something problematic in a way that feels okay. Another key strategy is to foster empathy, to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. As this wonderful poem about the Holocaust describes, in Germany, first they came for the communists and I didn't speak out because I wasn't a communist. Then they came for the Jews and I didn't speak out because I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for the trade unionist and I didn't speak out because I wasn't a trade unionist. Then they came for the Catholics and I did not speak out because I was a Protestant. Then they came for me and there was no one left to speak out for me. So one of the real challenges is that we need to put ourselves in somebody else's shoes and imagine how would I feel if it was me on that bus and somebody was attacking me or how would it feel if it was my son in a fraternity house not getting help? And being able to put ourselves in somebody else's shoes can help us step in all, up in all different kinds of situations. Um, these images were created by Oprah for her magazine a few years ago to try to help people see the world from a different perspective. How would it be to be a little girl looking at a bunch of dolls in a toy store? None of the dolls look like you. How would it feel if the people giving a pedicure and the people getting a pedicure were flipped in terms of ethnicity. So trying to imagine the world from somebody else's position can go a long way towards getting help. Um, in one very clever study, um, researchers created a situation in which a person needed help. And what they did was that in some cases, the person who needed help, I'm sorry, they recruited people specifically who were big fans of a particular sports team. So let's say, you know, Boston Red Sox. Um, and then they created a situation in which a person needed help, that, that he was jogging and he appeared to have fallen and hurt his ankle and was sort of clutching his ankle and aching in pain. And the question was, who stops and offer help? In some cases, the person is wearing a t-shirt that actually is your same team affinity. Oh, you know, you're a Red Sox fan and I'm a Red Sox fan. In the other case, the person is wearing a t-shirt that was of a rival um, uh, team. So, you know, the Yankees. Um, and the question is who stops and get help? Now, remember, they're all strangers. They're all strangers. You don't know this person. And yet sharing an identity of we both like the Red Sox, or in this case, we both like the Cubs, led people to stop and help at a far higher level than if the person was wearing a plain shirt or a shirt indicating a rival um, team support. And so that's an example about how even low levels of empathy can lead people to step up and help. Look for ethical leaders. In all different kinds of circumstances, ethical leaders really model what is the right kind of behavior. Um, there's a wonderful book about the Holocaust called Village of Secrets. And what this book describes is a small town in France in which there was a minister. And this minister said to all the people in the town, God loves the Jews, just like God loves us. And every time the Nazis swept through town and said, turn over your Jews, turn over your Jews, this particular town instead hid them in attics, in closets, in basements. And they saved an estimated 1,500 Jewish men, women, and children throughout Nazi Germany. And they did so because this one minister said, we're not gonna turn over the Jews. And that leadership mattered. Um, we know that ethical leadership also pays off. Um, a study by Harvard Business School um, found that CEOs whose employees rated them highly in terms of character traits, high in integrity, responsibility, forgiveness, compassion, had a higher average return on assets that was 9.35% over a two year period. And that was five times larger than firms ran by CEOs whose employees gave them low marks. So ethical leadership is not just something that we should strive for because it feels good. 
it also pays off. Ethical leadership matters. And ethical leaders of all types can matter. Pretty early in my career at Amherst, I was teaching an intro to psychology class and I had five football players in the class who came every time, they came regularly, but they never participated in class discussion. They just sat there silently. And after a few weeks, it was kind of looking depressing and demoralizing. And it was really setting a bad example for the other students in the class. So I decided to email the head football coach, EJ Mills, who's still the head football coach today. And I just said, um, hey, EJ, I got some of your guys in my class and they're really not participating. Do you think you could help me out? And EJ wrote back right away and said, yeah, can you tell me who the guys are? And I said, yeah, here are their names. And about a minute after I sent the email, email came back. EJ had emailed the five of them, CC'd me. And here's what the email from EJ said. Anyone who doesn't talk in Professor Sanderson's class doesn't play on Saturday. And you know what? That problem got resolved very quickly. They were active and eager participants from then on. I just needed to figure out who their leader was. Their leader was not me. It was EJ. That's fine. Um, but that's an example about how ethical leadership conveys norms in all kinds of situations. Um, here is a um, copy of a tweet that I pulled off of Twitter in June. Um, and it's by a young man, a college student at Mississippi State University. And here's what he said. Either change the flag or I won't be representing this state anymore. 100%. And I meant that. I'm tired. And what he said was, I'm not playing for Mississippi as a state as long as there is a Confederate flag. And about a week after he sent this tweet and he tagged the governor of Mississippi, Republican, Tate Reeves, about a week after he sent this tweet, guess what happened? Mississippi state legislator voted, yeah, you know what, we're going to change the flag. And as of November, it's now a magnolia flower. Um, so ethical leaders, can take all different forms. Find a friend. It's often really hard to be courageous. It's scary. So sometimes finding a friend can help us step up and do the right thing. Uh, the fraudulent blood doping company, Theranos, ran by Elizabeth Holmes, was brought down by two whistleblowers. They were young, they were early in their careers, and yet they recognized something was problematic. They went to her and she said, if you report it, I'm going to sue your families. I'm going to take their homes. You will never work in Silicon Valley again. But there were two of them together. They were courageous. They reported to the authorities and she was arrested. We probably recognize this iconic photo of these four brave young men who integrated the lunch counter in Greensboro, North Carolina in the 1960s. They faced the KKK protesting outside. They worried for their physical safety and rightly so. And yet they were friends and roommates and they stuck together. And that gave them the courage to speak up and made a real difference. You probably don't know these two young men, but you've probably heard about them. They were Swedish graduate students at Stanford University a couple years ago. They were biking across the campus one Saturday night when they saw a sexual assault on an unconscious woman lying beside a dumpster. They stopped their bikes, they pulled him off of her. And that's how we know her name today, Chanel Miller, being assaulted by Stanford swimmer, Brock Turner. And that's an example about how doing the right thing can be easier if you have someone with you. And I now wanna to turn to do our final poll question of today which is to ask you, I've talked about five strategies, getting training and practice, fostering empathy, sorry, four strategies, getting training and practice, fostering empathy, looking to ethical leaders and finding a friend. And I wanna know for you, which one do you find most useful? And this will be our final poll. And I'll just give you a minute. And I think again, you have to select just one choice. Sorry about that. But I give four because I'm really hoping that one of these will speak to all of us. And it's also important to recognize that different strategies are useful in different kinds of circumstances and situations. So 65% of you have already voted. Um, that was very fast. Um, 
Now, 75% of you have voted. Um, I will give you just another five seconds or so if anyone wants to get in um, their last vote. Now it's over 80%. Um, now it's at 85%. Um, if, if, if you want to vote, I'm going to give you a final five seconds and then I will um, share the answers so you can see what y'all thought. And I'm going to end the poll and I'm going to share the results. So getting training and practice, the thing that people found most useful. But as you can see, there were a sizable number of people who also thought fostering empathy and finding a friend was useful. And for some people looking to ethical leaders. So I give these four because we really need to recognize that different situations call for different kinds of strategies. Um, that calling out the bad behavior of a family member might be different than calling out the bad behavior of a stranger on public transportation or your boss. So having a range of strategies can help people have the courage to speak up in all different kinds of situations. And finally, I want to turn to what I think is the most important, and that is we need to change the culture. And I'm hoping by talking about this, by writing about this, that we can work together to change the culture so that it's one of speaking up instead of one of staying silent. And what we know is that changing the culture can happen very quickly. Uh, my daughter, Caroline, was born on May 17, 2004. And that is actually a historic date in our nation's history. You may not know why, it's not because she was born, but here's why. On May 17, 2004, Massachusetts became the first state in the United States to legalize gay marriage. So that was really a historic moment. Um, and 11 years later, June of 2015, the Supreme Court of the United States legalized gay marriage across the country. Caroline and I were driving in the car when that decision came down. And I turned to her and I said, oh my goodness, I cannot believe that the day you were born, there was just one state in the country who had just legalized gay marriage. And now 11 years later, it's legal across the country, the entire United States. And Caroline looked up at me and she said, yes, what took so long? <laughs> I said, that is not long, 11 years. That is not long for change. And that's an example about how quickly change can happen. So how does change happen? Change happens because we shift the culture. We shift the norms and we reach a tipping point. There's a very clever study that was done about 10 years ago now. And it was done to try to increase water conservation, help the climate. It was done in hotels. And what they did in this study was half of the people got a little plaque in their hotel room that said, please save our planet. You know, reusing your sheets and towels can save mother earth, um, you know, saves water and electricity and so on. Other people got a different plaque. The plaque said, 85% of our hotel guests reuse their sheets and towels because they care about Mother Earth. And then they look to see which was more effective. Can you guess? People don't care about Mother Earth. People care that 85% of guests care about Mother Earth. That led far more people to make a change. That's an example of reaching a tipping point. Very clever study done by political scientists at Yale. They sent voting pamphlets to different actual households in Michigan. And then they track to see voting rates. Some people got a pamphlet that said, voting is about being an American. Some people got a pamphlet that said, here's your polling hours and location. Some people said, voting is part of being in a democracy. And some people got a pamphlet that said, most of your neighbors vote. Then they looked to see what was most effective. And what they found, people don't care about America or democracy. They care about peer pressure. The one saying most of your neighbors voted led far more people to actually vote at the next election. And that's an example about the power of social norms and changing. We can reach a tipping point in which voting, reusing towels, speaking up becomes normative. And I want to share with you now a graph of support for the Black Lives Matter program um, protest from June 10th, 2020 and how it has mattered. And what you can see here is the Black Lives Matter movement following George Floyd's death, which is the very, very edge of that chart, changed dramatically. Most people didn't support it. Then there was a point around 2018 in which more people did. And following George Floyd's death, support for the Black Lives Matter movement and awareness of that 
increase dramatically. And that's an example about how a tipping point can happen in which all of a sudden things seem different. And I wanna end by sharing one of my favorite quotes and it's a quote by John Steinbeck about the choice that we all have in terms of our own behavior. Humans are caught in their lives and their thoughts and their hungers and ambitions in their avarice and cruelty and in their kindness and generosity too, in a net of good and evil. A man, after he has brushed off the dust and chips of his life, will have left only the hard, clean questions. Was it good or was it evil? Have I done well or ill? And my hope is that this talk has given people strategies for thinking about the choices they make and the power that we all have to step up and act in all different kinds of circumstances. Um, so I'm gonna turn down to questions in the Q&A. I do wanna say at the outset, um, sometimes people have a question that they don't wanna put in the chat. Um, it's totally fine to email me, that's my email. Um, you can also watch a version of this talk on my website um, at sandersonspeaking.com. Um, if you'd like a copy of this entire slide deck, if you email me, I'm glad to just send it out to you if you'd like to have it to reference later on. And for people who are really interested in some pandemic reading and, and understanding more of the research and strategies that I've described sort of loosely tonight, um, my book is available everywhere. Um, and my book is the basis for this talk, describing the psychology of inaction and the strategies we can all use to step up. So thank you so much for listening. Um, I'm super excited to turn to um, Q&A. Um, I am going to stop sharing my screen so that we can see each other a little bit better. Um, but I will put my um, email in the chat room if you didn't have a chance to, to um, look it up there. You can also Google me, Katherine Sanderson, and I come up very easily um, in lots of different situations. It's, it's not hard to find um, contact information. Um, so um, I'm going to put my I'm going to put my um, email um, right in the chat room so people can have that to, to reference later on. Um, and my website is sandersonspeaking.com. Um, and thank you all so much for listening. And I'm going to start, I think, by going to the top of the chat room because you all have probably seen what all you've um, done, but I have not. Um, and so I'm going to start um, by that before. So let's see. And so I'm just going to start at the very beginning and then I'm going to keep going down to the bottom. And again, I'm a professor, um, so I can talk forever. So when I've overstayed my welcome, um, feel free to cut me off and tell me to go home or really not go home because I'm home. But anyway. Um, all right. So let's see. Um, has anyone else seen a talk by Catherine recently? I have, but cannot remember the topic. Anyone else remember? So this is what I'm going to say. I think. Um, you might have heard me talk about the science of happiness. I, I've, I've done a number of talks about that, including for the Vermont Humanities Council. Um, and I've also um, done a talk on the psychology or the science of resilience, um, also for the Vermont Humanities Council, but also some other places. So if you go to my website, you can actually watch those talks um, for free um, on my website. There are video links, including some talks, as I say, with my whole body, like pre-pandemic, when I actually used to speak, not just um, virtually. Um, so yes, you probably you probably have um, seen me talk before, um, and and this is different a different kind of topic, um, kind of unfortunately. Um, and and Pamela has noted whistleblowers are often punished, and yeah, that's totally true, um, and that's why I really think we need to change the culture. Um, there's actually a, I talk about whistleblowers in chapter eight in my book, and I'm going to quote someone else, but this is again in my book, um, in which one of the first steps is to change the name of whistleblowers because whistleblowers kind of has a negative connotation. And um, one of the people who broke the, um, the tobacco scandal when the, the, to 60 minutes when uh, the, uh, cigarette companies were um, including you know, uh, nicotine to make it more addictive, what he said is we need to call whistleblowers people of conscience. So let's start by changing the name and rewarding and praising whistleblowers for doing the right thing. Um, and, and gosh, yes, I think we can think of lots of different examples um, at the federal level of um, impeachment and people standing up for their values and their constitution. Um, and by the way, if anyone is interested in this topic in particular, um, you can Google and probably find it or just email me. But I wrote a piece um, in June or July, and it was about Mitt Romney. It was about Mitt Romney becoming the only Republican in the United States history 
who actually um, voted to impeach a president um, of his own party. Mitt Romney alone um, did that. And I, the, the piece is entitled something like, what do Mitt Romney, Ashley Judd, and you know somebody else have in common? And I talk about what are the traits of people who are whistleblowers. So if you're interested in reading that, if you Google me, um, it'll come up. If you email Catherine, you Google Catherine Sanderson, Mitt Romney, it probably comes up very fast. Um, and Pamela also noted shunning is so punishing. Yeah, and I've talked about today um, that fear of ostracism um, leads people to be silent in all different kinds of situations. Um, what could any of us do today about what happened at the Capitol? So, you know, to me, what has gone on um, has been fascinating. Um, I, I actually wrote a piece December 23rd um, for USA Today. I wrote an opinion piece. Um, that was on explaining the silence of, um, actually, you know what, I can, this is going to really, this is going to really, really test um, my abilities, but I'm going to try um, to give you a piece that I wrote um, so that you'll have the link um, here. I have managed to do this. I'm extremely impressed with myself that I have managed to, to, to do this correctly. But anyway, um, so I'm, I'm going to paste the link here um, in. But if you go to this, um, what I talk about is the Republicans not standing up to Donald Trump and how we got where we are. Um, so that was published um, uh, December 23rd. So you can go back and read that. And I will say in what is sort of funny, if you go to my, um, I think if you go to Amazon and look at my book, um, there were some early blurbs by my book um, from Bill Kristol, noted conservative um, you know, activist in the Republican Party, also from George Conway, um, husband of uh, Kellyanne Conway. And they both blurbed my book very early on um, because they recognized the sort of impact um, of, of not speaking out in terms of the Republican Party. Um, yeah, Franklin Davis, thank you for that. So if you click the link now, you can open it in your browser um, uh, when the meeting ends, so thank you. Um, okay, sorry, now I've gotten completely waylaid um, and I have to go back to the earlier part of the chat. Um, so let's see. So, you know, to me, I think that, you know, what's happening politically these days um, is fascinating, but I also think that what we've seen with the people, the so-called never Trumpers or, you know, the Republicans who've spoken up like Mitt Romney, I think has actually been very inspiring because it's very hard to speak out um, and in fact, even today, Mitch McConnell um, on the floor um, said, you know, this is a democracy and, and sometimes votes don't go our own way and so on. Um, but it is, of course, very tragic. I'm hoping we still live in a democracy in um, two or three weeks. Um, and I would say there are certainly times in which um, people don't know how to step up um, and, it, and it can be very hard to know what to do. Um, the question that I get the most often, I don't know if this is gonna be later in the chat room, question I get the most often in which people really feel paralyzed are cases involving children. The question that I get the very most commonly when I talk about this is that people will say, I was in a grocery store. It's often a grocery store. I was in a grocery store and I saw um, an adult being what I considered abusive to a child. And I didn't know what to do because I worried if I spoke up, the adult would take it out on the child later on. I didn't know what to do. And to me, you know, that's, that's the one that, that I really sort of struggle with because I think there are cases in which we don't really know what's going on. Maybe that's a case in which somebody really does need to call 911 because maybe that child is being victimized and abused at home. Um, but there are also, of course, cases in which, you know, that parent is just having a bad day and maybe what you need to do is just go over and, you know, do peekaboo with the child or, you know, kind of distract the situation or show the child, uh, you know, a moment of kindness. Um, so again, I certainly don't think that there's one size that fits every solution. Um, and I think that the goal of my talk is to have people be more mindful. Um, what I hear again and again and what I've experienced myself are times in which I've seen or heard something, I haven't known what to do, I haven't said anything. And then like two days later, I'm in the shower and I'm like, oh, that's what I should have said. Or, oh, that's what I should have done. And so my goal is to have people be more mindful in the moment of, you know what, maybe I could do this or maybe I could step up um, and that can make a real difference. Um, and, and again, you know, different situations lead to inaction rooted by different causes. And that's important to recognize. Um, can we believe there are better days ahead? I'm grateful for those courageous enough to speak truth to power, risk the loss of, job, risk the loss of jobs, livelihood and social connections. And, you know, um, Regina, um, 
I think that's a really important point. Um, I read an interview in the New Yorker with uh, columnist Bill Kristol, again, noted conservative columnist Bill Kristol. And what he said when he came out and opposed Trump, you know, way back when, four years ago, what he said is, um, I had friends who became acquaintances and I had acquaintances who became strangers. Um, and he talked about how he was really, you know, kind of ostracized. Um, and so it's not easy always to do the right thing. Um, we can certainly see lots of examples, you know, historically and present day of people who paid the price. But I'll also say it's also not easy to stay silent, that often people experience huge regret and sadness and remorse over times in which they haven't spoken up. And to me, the biggest challenge with not speaking up is that what it leads to. Um, I remember a student in my office, a female student talking about how a male professor had um, asked her out, had sort of, you know, inappropriately asked her out um, in a, you know, sort of sexually harassing kind of way. And what I said to her is, you know, if you don't report this, he's going to do it to other people. And she said, I know, I just kept thinking, what if it was my sister? And, you know, to me, that's the example that, you know, Harvey Weinstein didn't start as Harvey Weinstein. Harvey Weinstein started at a low level and it escalated because no one spoke up. Um, okay, um, let's see. Um, um, I think we should be honest that we can be bought. It makes it easier to admit when we mess up that declaration that we are virtuous stops us from making corrections, e.g. I'm not a racist. Yeah, and I think that's true. I think there are lots of times in which people don't speak up for all sorts of different reasons and having that awareness is really important. Um, I also like the idea of, of trusting the power of small actions. Um, and so let's see, um, and, and many people, again, totally understanding the point of my talk that people don't wanna look foolish, that there could be a cost and so on. Um, and, I, and, and Paul D has made a comment. We also have to have a culture that lets people off the hook for acting like humans. Um, and I think that it's really important that we recognize that we all have a choice and I'm hoping to create a, a culture. Um, I do not know how many people are CPR certified. I am. Um, and I think it's a really important thing um, to do so. Um, and, and, uh, and, and David Brainbridge and, and Franklin Davis have both, I think, describing my earthquake example, have said the student spoke up when he realized no one was in charge. Yes, that is right. And the professor said, I don't know what to do. And that's also important. Um, and yeah, I think that's, those are all really important things. Um, and you guys have had an active discussion about, you know, ouch, et cetera. Um, Jennifer Heath has asked, will the webinar be available? I don't know if it was recorded. Was it recorded? Did you record it? It was. So it was recorded and, and it will be available in some way that you will tell people, right? It's on, it's on a YouTube channel and we, we, know, we put a notice in the uh, meetings.com. You know. Right. So yes, it will be available. It's, it's available. So that's good. Okay, excellent. Um, measurement of ethical leadership will depend on whether employees feel they can risk participating honestly. Yeah, that's right. And in fact, um, what research has shown is that that anonymous um, reporting is essential. And the other thing which I think is so important to recognize is that um, ethical leadership really matters because if you can identify bad behavior at a small level, it doesn't escalate. I mean, that's really the key. And so that's important. Um, this is a little bit of an aside, um, but um, I, I have been asked in what was really exciting, I was asked in, I think, November um, to join a board, um, which is ran out of the Georgetown University Law School. And it's a board called, I, I'm, the acronym is ABLE. And I, and I always kind of mess it up. But I think it's Active Bystandership for Law Enforcement. And, and what it is, is it's a group um, that goes in and works with police departments on how to help police officers call out and step up when their colleagues are at the risk of doing something problematic. Um, and that could be, of course, problematic, like what we saw in the George Floyd incident, but it could be, you know, roughing up a suspect. It could be lots of different things. And to me, I am so thrilled to be involved in that group. Um, and I've had the opportunity to go through, um, I did a three, uh, a three day training um, via Zoom um, with a bunch of uh, police officers from across the country in December. And it was really awe inspiring um, because that's an example of changing the culture from within. And I really can't think of a more important place to intervene right now. I was honored to be asked um, to be on that board and I'm super excited to, to get to work um, on, on making a difference in that way. Um, 
And, and Pamela's asked, how do we change the tattletale? Don't be a snitch culture that starts in childhood. That's such an important point. Cause again, that's the example of like, this is, that's a change the culture, right? That, that, that we identify people who speak up as being problems, as opposed to saying you're a part of the solution. And what I look at in terms of that is that that's really a part of changing the culture of saying, um, you know what, if you, if you, um, tattle on someone, what you're actually doing is helping them. What you're actually doing is helping them not get in more trouble. What you're doing is actually helping prevent a situation from escalating. But if you look at all kinds of things from corporate fraud to fraternity hazing, it starts small. And if it doesn't get stopped early, it escalates. Um, and so changing the culture so that being a whistleblower, being a tattletale or snitch isn't about doing something bad. It's actually about helping improve the situation. And that's actually something I talk about a lot in my book. Um, and it's actually something that we talk a lot about in terms of the work I'm doing um, with police officers across the country, which is to say, it's not, your loyalty is not to your colleagues doing bad things. Your loyalty is to the community and your loyalty is actually to help your colleagues not do bad things. That's what's loyal. Um, and let's see, um, uh, people who work in an informer culture may not want to participate, particularly if they may lose their job or retirement benefits. Yeah, the, the, the most effective um, groups are ones in which all of the surveys are done anonymously. So people do not actually have to worry about that kind of risk. And that's what's really important. Um, and um, I think I've answered the question, do you see this reluctance to speak up related to our political divide or even today's events in DC? And I would say yes. Um, and I will also say that I don't think that speaking up is a Republican thing or a Democratic thing or a liberal thing or a conservative thing. I think there are lots of situations in which people stay silent because they worry about the consequences. And those consequences of speaking up may be different depending on the specific culture or environment that you are in. Um, and and if somebody has asked a, a question via direct message about um, training that I would recommend. And I talk about lots of different training approaches in my book. Um, and so I'll say just a couple of things now. One, there are specific trainings that I do recommend, um, but they are sort of specific to different situations. So in my book, the first five chapters lay out kind of what I did in the first half of the talk today. Um, what are the sort of psychological factors that lead to inaction? Then chapter six, which I didn't talk about today, talks about um, schools and bullying and what do we do in that environment? Chapter seven talks about sexual harassment and misconduct in college settings and what do we do in that situation. And chapter eight talks about problematic behavior in the workplace. And so I'm, I'm, the challenge in terms of training is that training to prevent bullying in elementary school is different than training to prevent sexual misconduct in college students is different than what um, inhibits, you know, um, speaking up in workplace environments, in a corporate setting, in a police department, and so on. And so what's really important to recognize is that different kinds of training can be effective in different situations. Um, and so finding the training that, that fits your needs is really important. Another thing which I talk about again a lot in the book and which is part of my own research is that lots of empirical work shows that understanding the psychology of inaction helps people step up. So in a sense, you've all been kind of trained by listening to me talk because understanding the, the psychology that leads us to stay silent actually helps people um, step up in all different kinds of situations. Um, okay. And, and so now I think I'm, I'm getting closer to the end. Um, and so this is a question uh, from Pamela um, Edward Snowden and Chelsea Manning acted selflessly and lost their freedom. They got punished, not rewarded. How do we change the justice and economic systems as well as the culture? So to me, changing the culture to one of speaking up um, would change the reward and punishment because all of a sudden, instead of being like whistleblowers, snitches, tattletales, that's bad, we would say, we appreciate and commend those people. Um, we've seen some examples over the last year of people who spoke up um, in terms of problematic behavior that they saw in the Trump administration. Many of those people got fired. Um, and, and, and yet we recognize those people. I'm thinking of Alexander Vindman, for example, um, testifying on the floor of Congress and his heroism. Um, and so you can get fired and also be a hero. And, and that to me is really important to recognize. Um, and sometimes we don't recognize people who are heroes at the time. Um, I'm sure you've all heard about, you know, the horrific um, incident um, in which uh, in Vietnam, in which soldiers gunned down, you know, innocent men, women, and children in a ditch. And they were called out by another soldier who said, stop it. And if you continue to, 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 to fire, I'm going to start firing on you. 
Um, and he was recognized only years later for being a hero. At the time, he was absolutely ostracized, but he still did the right thing and he saved lives. Um, and um, next question, um, Judas iPhone in 2030, 50% of the US population will be vegan because they will consider the ethical and environmental reasons for doing so. And, and that to me could be an example, like I described in terms of support for gay marriage, that you can look at change happening very quickly. Um, I'm gonna do a non-poll question, just a raise your hand kind of question, um, which I love doing um, uh, with my college students. It, it always is hysterical for them. Here's the question, who here remembers when you bought a seat on an airplane, you had a choice of smoking or non-smoking. <laughs> Look at those hands. Now, if I tell my college students that, they're like, that didn't happen. I'm like, you did. you did. And they're like, no. Okay, who remembers when the very safest way that you could travel with a baby in a car was in your arms to keep them safe, right? And that now would get you like arrested. Those are examples of cultural norms. We are, most of us are old enough that we remember buying a seat on an airplane, smoking or non-smoking. No one would ever wear a helmet while bicycling. What are you nuts? Why would you wear a helmet while bicycling? Why would you wear a seatbelt? Why would you put your kid in a car seat? Um, go to a restaurant and there are ashtrays on the restaurant. Those are changed. That seems crazy right now. It seems crazy. But that's an example about how culture can change. And we can all play a part in changing the culture. Um, and yeah, Pamela said, of people of conscious, I like that. Again, I, I'm, I'm crediting someone else with it. It's not, my, it's not my expression, but I like it too. I like it very much. Um, how was it that Mitch McConnell and Mike Pence did the right thing today? Yeah, you know, that, <laughs> that was a moment, wasn't it? Um, and I, again, I look at Mitt Romney, moral rebel. Um, and then I pasted in my op-ed, which is in there. Um, and Pamela has said, we have to insist on justice rather than healing or moving on because we can't do either when the law doesn't punish the rich and powerful. Um, I will say my husband is a lawyer. Um, he worked for the attorney general's office in the state of Massachusetts. And this last um, year has been very sobering for him um, because he always thought of law as doing good, that law was about being on the side of right. And it's been a little bit demoralizing to him, I think, um, in, in a sense. Um, and Carolina said we, we could actually email our politicians to ask why the police didn't step up earlier today. Um, there will be books written about the people who were heroes and the people who were not. And um, I'm glad that Mike Pence and, and, um, and Mitch McConnell stepped up today. I wish it had been earlier. If it had been earlier, we wouldn't have gotten to this point today. Um, and Jennifer Heath has asked, um, have you prepared a workbook that might be part of a training effort or even self-training um, or used by a book club um, to work things through? So I have not prepared a workbook, but honestly, um, I've prepared a book. I've prepared a book. Um, and so this book, which I will, you know, again, um, is available everywhere. I mean, you can get it on Audible, which is me reading it aloud three days in a small room. Um, but one of the things that has been most rewarding for me about reading this, about writing this book is that I talk now all the time. Um, I've talked to groups of teachers. I talked to a group of teachers um, in Portland, Oregon in August, as, as you might remember, Portland was facing all of those protests, you know, et cetera. Um, and, and we worked through the book. They read the book. They read it as a book group recommended by their superintendent. And we read it through. And then I came and did author visits. Um, I've done this talk for law firms. Um, I've done this talk for um, a town in Rhode Island that was having some issues in terms of some racial incidents and asked me to step in. Um, and so I've done it in lots of different circumstances. Um, I'm doing it now, as I said, with police officers. Um, and so to me, you know, the book is, is written at, you know, it's not written at a, you know, middle high school level or so. Um, but, but the book is really my attempt um, to help people understand the psychology of it and, and to give people practical tools. The, um, Chapter nine examines who, what are the traits of people who do step up? What are the traits of the so-called moral rebels? And chapter 10 goes through in much more depth the things I talked about in the last part of this talk about the different strategies. So it's not a workbook, but it's my attempt to share um, and I'm hoping it can be used. And, and I talk to book groups all the time. Um, and Courtney has asked any specific thoughts on the current cancel culture. I have mixed thoughts. And I, and that is a great question. I actually never used to get that until around June or July. Now I get it all the time. And I too have mixed thoughts because I think one of the challenges is that it can lead people to be hesitant to speak up or say something out of fear of, oh, maybe that's the, you know, and, and that can actually, so I actually think the cancel culture has, um, 
has gone a step too far. Um, and, and, and a cancel culture is actually part of kind of ganging up and being, you know, in a group. It's not really standing up to a group in that sense. So some people are like, yeah, I'm standing up to bad behavior. But if you're standing up as part of a mob to bad behavior on behalf of one person, that's not really being a moral rebel in that sense. Um, um, somebody has asked, what do you do if somebody is upset and crying, but you can't change what caused it? Um, and that's a really important question. Thank you for raising that. And to me, what I think is there are times in which we can't fix it, but not being alone. So I think of that, um, my friend's daughter who's on the bus in Boston, in which the person was saying, you brought us the coronavirus you know, pandemic. Um, and the person couldn't change what the man had said or what he was yelling. But how about if one person on that bus had gone and sat with her and been like, hey, you know, what are we going to do this weekend? Or, you know, oh, where'd you get that purse? Somebody could have just gone and sat with her. And that probably would have felt really nice. Couldn't have solved it, couldn't have fixed it, but she wouldn't have been alone. Um, and so to me, that's something. Um, Carolyn has said, you have to trust the system. I have worked at two places where anonymity was breached and the people complaining paid the price. And yeah, that's, you know, there are lots of different cir circumstances. I often get asked the question of, you know, I want to speak up, but you know, I'm low. I don't, you know, I need, I need this job. I, I don't want to get fired. And so I think there are times in which it's really important, um, to know that you can't do anything and to recognize the times in which you can. Um, so I have tenure at Amherst College. It's really, really hard to fire someone with tenure. Um, and so I make a point now of speaking up in different situations in which I'm with colleagues who may not be able to speak up because they may not have that, um, that luxury. We had an incident in my department a few years ago, I actually talk about this in the book, um, in which one of my colleagues um, was stealing from the college. <laughs> um, and the secretary, my you know, administrative assistant found out and she tried to report it but she didn't have any job security and she was really worried and she was trying to do the right thing, but she was also really worried she was getting fired. And so I was like, you know what, I'll just handle it. And I just took it up to the Dean. and was like, Hey, I'm concerned. And, and who should I call? Do you want me to call the police? You know, whatever. And then it got handled. Um, but, but it couldn't get handled by her because she didn't have job security. And so sometimes it doesn't have to be you speaking up. Sometimes it could be you saying, Hey, you know what, you know, could you help, you know, could somebody else help? Um, and I think people who are in power positions have a moral and ethical responsibility you know, to be the squeaky wheel um, if, um, if they're in that situation. Um, again, you know, I can go on forever. So when, I, when you, you're tired of me, you can, you can tell me. Um, and, and so we've talked about cancel culture and, um, and, and Paul has said, I think we shouldn't put the responsibility of being virtuous on personal integrity so much. We should set up society so it doesn't require so much effort. Absolutely. That is my goal. That is my goal is that we reach this tipping point in which speaking up becomes the norm and it's, and, and therefore um, it doesn't require so much effort or the, con or the consequences um, in that sense. And, and what we know is that changing the culture can happen and there's just a tipping point. There's a tipping point in which enough people do something in which it becomes normative and you're not the only person. Um, and yeah, and basically saying this is the, the usual thing where someone when power was trying to get away with it, it's exactly as we would expect, yeah. I mean, so in a sense, I said before Mitt Romney, you know, hero, Mitt Romney did the right thing. You know, Mitt Romney did the right thing, but of course he did the right thing and, and was like the only one. Um, and, and then I think it's kind of a lot of the right thing too. I, I'm sorry, say it again which gave him the power to do the right thing because he didn't have to uh, have any consequences. Yes, I think that's exactly right. Um, and, then, and then maybe this is a good one um, as a final one, um, which is from Franklin Davis, which is what builds personal resilience? Where does your personal optimism and positivity come from? Um, do you think that trait may have a substantial genetic component? So this is what I'm gonna say. In chapter nine, I describe um, at length, what do we know about moral rebels? What do we know about the people who speak up? And there basically are three things. Um, one, people tend to be low in social inhibition. They don't really worry if people like them. Um, I, I had a funny podcast interview a couple of days ago and somebody you know, asked me a similar question. He goes, well, why do you think you, know, you chose to write this book or speak up? And I said, for whatever reason, I think I don't really care if people like me and that's okay. I'm like, you know, 
people haven't liked me before, people won't like me in the future, you know, that's all right. They're just not liking me and that's no big deal. Um, and so I think part of it is that, that there's some people that feel really um, a lot of social inhibition and there are other people that just don't really seem to care so much. So I think that's one thing. Um, another thing, people who are high in um, a tendency to speak up tend to be very high in empathy. They can really put themselves in somebody else's shoes and therefore somebody else experiencing pain really feels bad to them. Um, there's fascinating research um, conducted by somebody else, not me. Um, that describes the traits of people who donate a kidney to a stranger. So donating a kidney to a stranger is like a crazy act of empathy, right? Like you're putting yourself, you know, undergoing some pain and, you know, potential risk and so on to help a stranger. But what you see about those people is there's part of their brain in which what, what appears for them is that somebody else being in pain feels to them like being in pain. It actually feels painful to see somebody else in pain. Um, and so that level of empathy um, is probably, probably does have some kind of a genetic component. And then the third thing, um, and as the mother of a really argumentative 16 year old daughter, I take a lot of solace in this, um, children who argue with their parents. Children who argue with their parents tend to be better at standing up to peer pressure. Um, this is research that's done at the University of Virginia. And, and what that research suggests is that you get practice arguing with mom and dad. And so when you're in some situation of peer pressure, you're more likely to stand up because you've already kind of gotten your practice in um, arguing with mom and dad. So I'm hoping that there is like, that is my silver lining of having a pretty um, argumentative daughter. Um, I think, I got through the questions, um, but I want to say to you all, thanks for thanks for listening. Thanks for the fabulous questions. Um, as you can tell, giving this talk is super meaningful to me. Um, I'm, I'm, it's being recorded. You can listen to it again if you'd like a copy of my slide deck. Again, um, I'm glad to send that out to you very quickly. Um, and again, I, as you can tell, I'm hoping talking about this gives people tools and strategies so that we can all work together to change the world. It's a pretty modest goal. Um, so anyway, th thank you for listening. Um, stay safe, everyone. And I hope that's what you wanted. Thank, thank you, you so much. Yeah, thank you. Yes. <laughs> All right. Take care. Thanks for the invitation to talk. Stay safe, everyone. We enjoyed it. All next month, everyone. Okay. All your friends. Bye,